We understand this debilitating condition that affects an estimated 176 million women worldwide. Besides all our differences, at least we share one common thing. South Africa's uh, sneakerheads and craze for shoes that tell a story. We find out. The doctor tell me I'm going to sour. Retire with the time. We highlight a woman with a rare case of bleeding through the novel during menstruation. And Italy launches an ICU train to evacuate and treat COVID patients. Thank you for joining us on this broadcast. We are within the Endometriosis Awareness Month. And speaking of which, our question of the day to you this morning is, do you know someone or are you living with endometriosis? What are the challenges you face living with this condition? Share with us that hashtag is new normal. And as always, you can reach us using the numbers at the bottom of your screen. Before we get to that conversation, let's take a look at the impact of COVID-19 around the world. And this morning, those numbers stand at 118,159,602 confirmed cases of COVID-19 around the globe. Out of that number, 93,846,189 have totally recovered from the same and unfortunately 2,622,101 have succumbed to COVID-19. Now in the country, 109,643 Kenyans confirmed to have contracted COVID-19. Out of that number, 87,736 have recovered from the same. At this point, it will be important to note that these numbers also represent the foreigners who are in the country. And unfortunately, we have lost 1,886 deaths. As I will reiterate here and keep doing so, is that even if we now are inoculating our population, it is important that you continue to wear your mask wash your hands regularly with soap and water and of course practice social distancing now a look at some of the stories making headlines this wednesday and opposition leader osman sonko was freed from detention on monday but also charged with rape while protesters held rocks at riot police in the capital dakar usually considered a beacon of stability in a volatile region senegal has been rocked by its worst unrest in years which began after sonko was arrested last week after his release osman sonko leader of the PASTEF party said, for the past few days, my sleep has been very disturbed, not because of a case in question, but because there has been too much damage, too many victims, too many martyrs, too many people killed, too many wounded, too many people taken prisoner, and too many grieving families. <laughs> South Africa's community of Afri Afri Africionados of sneakers has been growing since the 1990s. Now, trendy dresses are willing to fork out as much as 100,000 rand for their footwear. Local de designers, rather, and uh, are also coming up with new ideas to appeal to sneakerheads. 
first person that gets here um, gets to get the sneakers according to different sizes. It's really hard to find the shoes, so once you get them, you actually get the beat. It's like that wouldn't have happened like 30 years ago. So uh, I guess it's a one way of uniting us and bringing us together as, uh, as people, as a country, as different races, to say besides all our differences, at least we share one common thing, which is like, you know, shoes. It's a dunk. Being a sneakerhead in Soweto is actually dope, you know? Simply because when you have the, the, the nicest shoes, you grab a whole lot of attention, you know what I mean? The shoes, is, it's not even about race or gender, it starts becoming about class. It's an, almost like an investment to say you're helping yourself so that you can, you can, you can live with these people, so that you can, you can become a part of this thing, and then hopefully you don't struggle. Almost like fake it till you make it type thing. The nice thing about the community here is no matter how much money you have, there's always a way in. If you're wearing Converse, if you're wearing Dunks, if you're wearing Jordans, if you're wearing Yeezys, no matter what it is, as long as you have a passion for the sneaker, you're always welcome here. So I mean, you might not be able to afford it now, but you still have asking questions about a Dunk. You still have the history and the heritage of a Jordan 1. And that's the important thing. It's not about if you don't have them, then you can't be a part of it. Elsewhere, a trawler containing 130 tons of fuel oil ran aground near the Maurit Mauritanian capital, Port Louis, on Sunday. And this comes after Mauritius experienced one of the worst maritime pollution in its history seven months ago with the grounding of the MV Wakashio, which dumped 1,000 tons of fuel in its turquoise water. Now to something that has been trending an Australian newspaper front pages and celebrity magazine splash with details of a two-hour sit-down with Oprah Winfrey by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. The Australian carrying the headline Meghan's explosive tell-all divides palace. Sydney's Daily Telegraph headlines with soap opera while the Sydney Morning Herald leads with Tatol Royal rocks the monarchy. I think it's rather unedifying to have any family fighting in public um, and as the media is always obsessed with celebrity so I'm not surprised that they're trying to jump onto the uh, story. It's really none of our business. I just think that they should stop going on television and um, telling everybody how they feel about things and then claiming that they need privacy. There seems to be somewhat of a contradiction in the logic. Now, the German Airborne Emergency Medical Service, DRF, the second largest in Germany, has been able to operate at full capacity despite the COVID-19 pandemic and completed 40,000 interventions in 2020. In March and April of last year, part of these operations involved moving French patients to German hospitals during the first wave. Felix Schumacher, an emergency doctor at the DRF Air Rescue Service, says during the flight, the patient cannot be handled because the cabin is too narrow so it takes a lot of experience to decide what treatment to give beforehand and how to load the patient into the helicopter now the work is exciting and the fact that we are flying is a real plus Now, as Italy reaches 130, 
100,000 COVID-19 deaths, an ICU train departs from Rome to evacuate and treat patients all over the country. The train allows up to 21 patients to be evacuated from a certain area and treated on board with ICU equipment. Weekly infection numbers rose by a third to more than 123,000 cases between February the 24th and March the 2nd and the highest since early December. As hospital in intensive care units are again coming under pressure, the government is considering new restrictions. Back to our conversation of the day and we focus on endometriosis and speaking of which, let's take a look at exactly what it is or what it entails and hear a story about living with this condition. Endometriosis is an often painful disorder in which tissue that normally lines the inside of your uterus grows outside your uterus. The condition mostly involves the ovaries, fallopian tubes and the tissue lining your pelvis but can also spread to other parts of the body. It takes an average of 10 years for women to be diagnosed with endometriosis as it's often mistaken for other conditions that can cause pelvic pain. There there is no cure for endometriosis and surgical or medical treatments remain the most effective methods of managing the condition. Timely diagnosis can enable proper management of the condition, giving the patient a chance at a quality life. The pain started when I was around class 7. I first had my periods in class 6, so that time I ran my periods for 3 months. Constantly, you know, without knowing, I used to think that once you've started your periods, you know, it's supposed to go on for a lifetime until my uh, my mom one time, she found me in my room changing my bed and she asked me, you're not done? And I'm like, no, 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 but DJ, she can't even afford to go to the hospital, the hospital, the hospital. So you went to the hospital, I got checked, that's when I started another hormonal therapy. That was the first time I was on hormonal therapy. So the, my periods got regulated to around five days. But once it got regulated, that's when I had, I began having cramping. I remember there was a night prep one time. I was in class, I was in pain, I was crying. You know, people could look at you, but they couldn't help because, you know, the strictness of the school. So I could just stay there crying in pain because I couldn't go to the nurse because sometimes, you know, they could say that, you know, you're pretending. I've already given you painkillers, those are the strongest painkillers, but sometimes, you know, they just don't understand the fact that I'm in more pain, I need something more to help me. Then I was diagnosed with endometriosis stage 2. There's this myth that uh, when you get pregnant and have a baby, the symptoms reduce or the end disappears. So being 19, and I just like, wow, where can I get a man who's going to give me a child, a man who's going to father my child, a man who's going to fund my child and me. It was so much to take in for me. The hardest part has been uh, seeing my mom looking at me anytime I'm in pain, seeing her struggle trying to help me as much as she can. You learn to laugh through the pain. Really discovering endo at an early age instead of just listening to people, trying to see that uh, gynecologists are quite expensive. I think it's just a matter of taking that uh, risk or taking that opportunity to know what's going on with your body. That is the reality for those living with endometriosis. As I mentioned, this is Endometriosis Awareness Month that is in March. And of course, the color is normally yellow. Now, to help us understand further about this condition, we have in studio Dr. Charles uh, Muteshi, who is an obstetrician and gynecologist at the Aga Khan University Hospital. We are also joined virtually from Mombasa by Esther Kimemia, 
who is an endo warrior, founder of the Yellow Endo Flower Foundation. And next to her is her husband, who is also her primary caregiver, that is Peter Kimemia. Now over to Kisumu, and we have Beryl Akinyi Okech, who is an endo warrior. And next to her is her husband and her primary caregiver, that is Richard Okech. Thank you all for joining us this morning. As I mentioned today, we'll not only understand what endometriosis is, but also understand the intricacies of the same within marriage. But before we get to it, as we had seen earlier on in some of those graphics, is that endometriosis is an often painful disorder in which tissue that normally lines the inside of your uterus, the endometrium, grows outside your uterus. Dr. Muteshi, what causes this? Um, thanks for having me here today, this morning. And um, uh, just to shed some more light on uh, endometriosis. Uh, for years and years now, we've battled to understand what is the cause of endometriosis. So I'm disappointed to say that we don't yet know what causes endometriosis. We made great strides in understanding how the disease progresses and affects um, uh, those who are affected. Uh, it's postulated, though, that uh, because women have regular menstruation, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps uh, a bit of uh, the menstrual blood could escape back through the tubes into the linings of the pelvis, mm -hmm. and uh, that tissue can grow uh, and cause uh, uh, endometriosis symptoms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, and uh, the condition most commonly involves the ovaries, as you said, the reproductive uh, organ, but the tissue, but actually this can actually go to other parts of the body, right? Indeed. Um, majority of cases of endometriosis are limited to the pelvis in mm -hmm. up to 98%. Uh, however, we find a small uh, proportion of women mm -hmm. with endometriosis in other parts of the body. Mm -hmm. uh, most commonly, it will be uh, within the chest cavities, lining the lungs, or around the belly button or umbilicus. Uh, mm -hmm. But we've seen endometriosis uh, in scar tissue on the abdomen, and uh, even in far places, uh, such as the brain. Uh -huh. And uh, are there any gen genetics at play here? Because we, all women of reproductive age, go through this monthly occurrence, but it seems that there is a unique few that actually go through endometriosis. Uh, and that's the enigma, because we don't really know why some will develop endometriosis and others won't. Uh, the genetics is not straightforward because it's not an, a direct inherited condition, mm -hmm. but there will be a predisposition. So if you have a family member with endometriosis, uh, you're probably nearly eight times more likely to have endometriosis compared to someone else without a family member with endometriosis. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are other mechanisms that uh, are possibly at play uh, which would make women develop endometriosis. Uh, for example, how their immune system or defenses uh, interact uh, mm -hmm. with uh, uh, cells within the pelvis. And uh, uh, certain other conditions, for example, if you have uh, an abnormality of uh, the genital system where there's obstruction uh, or blockage of flow of menstrual blood, then you're more likely to have uh, endometriosis. Mm -hmm. Now let's hear from those that walk in these shoes and I'll start off with you. Esther, when were you diagnosed with endometriosis? I was diagnosed with four years old. Mm -hmm. And I was uh, seeing many doctors and also just seeing in a lot of things. But it, it was my second doctor. That's my surgery that Okay, now at this point, I think I'll just stop you there because I can barely hear you properly. We seem to be having a problem with your audio, but even as we rectify that, let me cross over to Beryl. Beryl, when were you diagnosed with endometriosis? Morning. Good morning. I was, I was diagnosed with endometriosis in 2018. Okay, and when what I was led... having Mm -hmm. Then I was having my second surgery. Okay, so what led to the diagnosis? I had ovarian cysts. Mm -hmm. Yes. So when so they... I had called. Go ahead. Around 
Around December 2017, I was pregnant, and within that month, I miscarried. Around February, I got pregnant again, and I miscarried once again. Now, I had this urge to know why I'm miscarrying, because my then doctor told me that I'm not just ready to have a kid, that the attachment is not ready. So around July, I fainted in the house. So when he took me to the hospital, that's when I knew that his ovarian cyst which was disturbing me. So after that 20, after that July surgery, around December when I was not getting well after this surgery, that's when I was told that I have endometriosis stage two. Okay, and at this point, how far gone was it? It was far gone because I already lost my my right ovary and I've already lost my fallopian tube. So if I knew early, maybe I could not have lost these two things. Was this the first time you were okay. hearing the word endometriosis? Yes, it was our first time. We have... We, 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 we also googled and we, would, we could not get answers to what this what is this disease mm. or this condition mm -hmm. it is still a nightmare till today because every day we have new symptoms okay speaking of symptoms what symptoms are these like i have nausea i have pelvic, pelvic pains mm -hmm. my bowels hurt uh, last year, after our interview, mm -hmm. I received black periods for three months, which also took me back to hospital around July. I had another surgery. So oh. every day symptoms are new. All right. Now, All right. have we rectified the sound with Esther Kimemi and her husband? Okay, we'll cross over to you as soon as we do so. Now, Daktari, she talks about some of the symptoms associated with endometriosis. Which others are there? Indeed. Um, not everyone with endometriosis will have symptoms. However, mm -hmm. uh, we, we do know that majority of them will be related to pain. And uh, the commonest symptoms of uh, pain will be pain during menstruation. And these characteristically will be present right from the beginning of periods uh, around puberty. Uh, about 10% of girls may have pain before their periods appear. So it, it's always important to be on the watch out and remember that endometriosis is not restricted uh, only to grown women. Mm -hmm. So it, it starts early and uh, characteristically we know there's a huge delay in diagnosis of up to 10 years in some places. Mm -hmm. and, and that's if you're lucky because most women live with endometriosis and they have no clue or access uh, to ability for diagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from period pain, uh, there might be pain uh, with uh, bodily functions such as uh, uh, going to the toilet uh, or uh, being intimate uh, with your partner. Uh, sometimes, as I said, uh, um, uh, endometriosis in the umbilicus or belly button you may have bleeding that is cyclic, meaning uh, every time you have a period, uh, you have uh, bleeding. Uh, those who have endometriosis in the chest cavity or thoracic endometriosis may have chest pains uh, that are uh, coinciding uh, with their periods, or their lungs collapse, or they may experience a nosebleed uh, every time they, they have a period. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, obviously, there is an association between endometriosis and fertility. Mm -hmm. uh, and some couples may find that they are struggling to get a baby. And uh, all tests are done. And, and sometimes we find they have endometriosis as a, a factor. Mm -hmm. Now, you're talking about some of the symptoms sound very similar to what you would go through on a normal cycle. So how do you know you're having a normal abdominal cramping period as opposed to having endometriosis symptoms? Uh, yes, and that's the essence of this month. It's actually to demystify uh, period uh, discomfort. So uh, there's no discomfort that is normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is no classical symptom of endometriosis. So if any of the symptoms worry you, it's always important uh, to speak to your doctor and uh, treat what is common. And if it's not going away, 
uh, or the symptoms are out of proportion to what you think could be causing symptoms and it's worth investigating further. Mm -hmm. And uh, Beryl mentioned that she was diagnosed with stage 2. So clearly there are different stages to this condition. So what determines the levels or the stages? Is it the pain? Is it the extremity of the, co of the condition? Ironically, uh, symptoms don't correlate with the amount of disease, so especially pain. You can be in excruciating pain uh, that's completely debilitating, but you have a, a stage 1 endometriosis. Oh. Or you have what you call stage 4 endometriosis, which is completely silent. So for us to make that diagnosis, you require something called laparoscopy. It's an operation where we pass a telescope through uh, the navel when uh, you've been put to sleep. Mm -hmm and uh, a specialized doctor will assess the extent of disease and give it a stage. Uh -huh. Now let's hear from uh, Esther Kimemia now. When were you diagnosed with endometriosis and what led to the same? Okay, so I was diagnosed when I was 19. That was now the beginning of 2010. And I had a lot of pain during my periods. My symptoms were, I was very bloated, like I had the endo, endo belly. So I couldn't fit into my dresses at the time. I couldn't fit into trousers at the time because my tummy got like I was four months pregnant. I'd faint sometimes because of pain. I had pain with bodily functions, as Dr. Kari has mentioned. Pain when peeing, pain when having a bowel movement. And I didn't know that was abnormal until I was in my early 20s because that's when it could be resolved itself. But it was the excruciating pain during my periods and also during ovulation as well. So mm -hmm. my first surgery was a surgery to investigate the pain during urination. But it didn't really help. I got a, a diagnosis of chronic cystitis and I was put on antibiotic, but it kept coming back. That's now when we went in for further investigation. Okay, and at this point, did you have any other family member that had the same symptoms as you? You know, the thing about living with endometriosis in Kenya is that pain has been normalized. So my mom would tell me that she used to have painful periods or she used to lie on the floor, but there was no formal diagnosis. So I can't really say yes or no. All right, interesting. And uh, thankfully for you, even with this diagnosis and endometriosis, you've gone on to be a mother, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When did you get your first child? I had my first baby in 2014. Mm -hmm. And my journey with endometriosis then was very different from what it's like now because a lot of changes were made even in between. But I remember one day I woke up and I told Peter, <clears throat> I'm done with the medication because I didn't feel like myself. And I didn't know how else to tell him I don't feel like myself, but I felt like I was losing myself in the process. So I got off the medication and probably about seven months later, I got pregnant. Aha, uh -huh. interesting. Now, the question is, when you were younger, underwent uh, the, this uh, diagnosis and they said you had endometriosis. Had you been alerted that there is a possibility you might not get pregnant? Yes, and of course I was pressured to get a baby at 19 years old. Mm -hmm. But I think earlier on I started reading a lot more and I understood that it depends how the endometriosis has affected your reproductive organs. Mm -hmm. And I had endometriosis dominantly affecting one of my ovaries and my intestines. So there was a 50-50 chance that I would still get pregnant from the other side. All right. And earlier we heard that uh, there's this myth that um, pregnancy is supposed to alleviate either the pain or reduce or totally uh, get rid of endometriosis. True or false? I'm glad you said it's a myth. <laughs> it's, it's a myth because pregnancy in itself is a miracle. Like they're so, it's, I feel like it's a gamble or a walk of faith. Yes. And so many things could happen. Your body also carries it very differently because of endometriosis. But there are still symptoms, some that are painful and other symptoms as well that linger on even after pregnancy. Yeah. Okay, Beryl, your story is a little bit more different because you have not been able to conceive, right? Yes. What has been the struggle? Uh, as we are 
Uh, it's a whole package struggle because since I was diagnosed with endometriosis, even my sexual life had to change because most of the time I'm always in pain. Uh, as we've had people that no longer talk to us because they have not been able to be parents, we have family members that have neglected us. So ours is a struggle. Okay, now before we get to the social impact, explain to me what the doctors say, why it is that you cannot be able to conceive. I'm not able to conceive because I don't have fallopian tubes. Both of them? Both of my fallopian, yes, both of my fallopian tubes were removed mm -hmm. because of ovarian cyst and endometriosis. So for me to conceive, I have to go through IVF process. Okay. Now let me stop you at that point. I'll get back to more of that journey. And Dr. Tari, here we have two women living with endometriosis but have different experience. Explain why the discrepancy in the first place. Uh, mainly because um, uh, we think endometriosis is one disease, but it's probably uh, several diseases that manifest in almost similar ways. And they could uh, affect someone uh, in, in, in various uh, uh, ways. But I think mainly it's also the extent of the disease. Mm -hmm. For example, if you've got an uh, early disease which hasn't really affected the organ so much, mm -hmm. Uh, it's likely that um, uh, you know conception will ha will happen because the tubes are still normal and uh, the ovaries are functioning optimally. Uh, but where we have extensive disease that is causing scarring and organs being stuck together, uh, uh, for example, the tubes are blocked or the ovaries have got cysts on them, uh, and there is what we call deep endometriosis between uh, the bowels and uh, the back of the womb or the vagina, mm -hmm. then it becomes uh, uh, extremely complicated. One, intimacy will be difficult, mm -hmm. and uh, where there's mechanical obstruction, for example, in the fallopian tubes, uh, that will make it impossible to conceive. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, certain treatments may also mean that organs are uh, taken away. And uh, if you remove ovarian cysts, uh, there's a small chance that normal tissue from the ovaries may come away with that mm -hmm. and that can affect how uh, the ovaries work and unfortunately again if the tubes have been caught up in all that and uh, they've been removed at surgery uh, and then the possibility of natural conception uh, is unlikely. Mm -hmm. Now Esther has said from experience that uh, pregnancy does not alleviate the pain that comes with endometriosis or even get, get rid of it. So what is this that people think that when you get pregnant some of these things will go away? Because I remember even during uh, puberty we were told for those that cramped a lot, don't worry, when pregnancy comes you'll be fine. Uh, it's mainly because um, not all pain is due to endometriosis mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we do have uh, what we call primary dysmenorrhea which means uh, there is pain but no identified uh, cause for it. Uh, a good proportion of girls or ladies who have this condition may find that their pain goes away a fallen childbirth. Mm -hmm. uh, but those who have endometriosis are more likely to have their symptoms persist. Uh, of course, some of them uh, will tell us through experience that they had a baby and uh, their symptoms got better. We also know that uh, endometriosis may be linked to uh, difficulty in conceiving. Mm -hmm. So it, it's actually uh, led to this misconception that uh, if you get a baby, you may have uh, less symptoms of endometriosis because when you look at those with children and those without children, mm -hmm. uh, those with children more likely may not have endometriosis and those without children could have endometriosis. So that kind of uh, distorted interpretation of data. Yeah. Okay. Now let's bring in the gentlemen in this conversation. As I said, both husbands are the primary caregivers to their wives. And I'll start off with you. Peter, and um, you meet this young girl and uh, she perhaps, I don't know, she, did she first of all um, let you know that she had endometriosis before you got married? Uh, well, <clears throat> I, I, knew, I knew she was, uh, she had endometriosis before we got married because uh, actually during, I think the period that we were dating this once, I actually had to rush her to hospital because mm -hmm. she suddenly went into pain uh as we were hanging out together and 
now being the person who was with her, there was no time to even call uh, anyone. So I just took her to uh, hospital. And I think for me, that was my first interaction with just endometriosis because you have someone who's just in a lot of pain and, uh, you know, it's difficult. I remember she actually got, ended up getting admitted. So, uh, and then from there now, of course, we walked the journey. So I, 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 I knew definitely before we, we got married that uh, it was something that uh, she was dealing with. So during the courtship, you get this diagnosis that there is a possibility she might never conceive, but you still went on to marry her. Tell us why. Um, uh, 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 for me, I guess the, 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 the primary thing was that, you know, you, 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 you care for someone, mm -hmm. you're trusted to begin life with them, and uh, you know uh, that they could be or they might not be a child. But I think for me also there's an aspect of faith where, you know, you're believing and you're trusting that uh, there's the what there's a medical report, but also you know you have trusting in a uh, in a higher being that there's a, that you know uh, can give birth and just because certain circumstances in a certain way, it doesn't mean that that is the that is the end. All right, and uh, let's just be honest here. You're a human being. You're getting this diagnosis. You're dealing with all these things. Your wife or the, your girlfriend then is uh, facing excruciating pain. What's going through your mind? Uh, I believe for me, the first time, of course, it was a shock, especially because uh, even as she continued, I think even she went through uh, two, two surgeries in the course of our, our, our courting. And for me, the th I think the biggest uh, concern was just that, um, one, the person seems to be in a lot of pain, which many people don't understand. And so a lot of people took it as either you're, she's exaggerating the pain or... or she's either exaggerating the pain or or there's something she's not saying and then the second thing is it's also sometimes you could get to a point where you feel also helpless because you mm. you, you this, this person is in a lot of pain and other than maybe just offering moral support there's nothing really else you can do mm. uh, just because it's, it's a, a place where uh, you know uh, a lot of times even with doctors you talk to different doctors i think when you saw a couple of doctors it you know one would say this, another one would say this. So uh, initially, you, you, you're you just also start grappling with a lot. And then also for me, it also made me have to become acquainted with endometriosis. You know? So mm -hmm. I also had to read the meat. I also had to try and understand uh, what exactly was happening with her. Okay. Now, Esther, on a scale of 1 to 10, with 10 being the worst, what are the levels of pain you experience? 11. Wow. Okay. Hold on to that thought. We'll be back to that in a moment. Now, remember, our question of the day to you is, do you know someone? Are you living with endometriosis? And what are the challenges you face living with this condition? And you are talking to us. Remember that hashtag is new normal. Job and Jaggi says, I remember some lady friend in campus. She couldn't even attend lectures those days. She had to remain indoors until she had finished her monthly period. Thank you, Job. Jacinta Wakimuyu says people with the condition really suffer. Looking at someone uh, suffer due to something which is normal to you is painful. God gives strength to those with the condition. I salute those ladies. They are really strong. Thank you, Jacinta. Doris Mary says, all I can say here is that I thank Dr. Washira in Kiambu, a very nice lady who is a gyno, for walking with me and holding my hand every month for the last four years. Otherwise, I would be long gone. Thank you, Doris, for sharing. Ngiro Christopher says, women under such conditions go through hell, ranging from pain, rejection from themselves and the general society. If it's extended, if it's extent of a damage, it's if... The extent of damage is high. I feel for them and may God really heal and protect those who go through such and other reproductive difficulties. 
Florida Ngure says the victims suffer in silence. They are warriors, only them, and God knows what they go through. True, Flora, thank you. And we have Ruby Laura who says, pain, we suffer too much pain. Period pain, especially sometimes you just cry because you can't do anything. Laura, hugs to you and thank you for sharing. And uh, we'll get to take more of your comments and, of course, even as you share those amongst you who are living with this condition, their experiences. And if you are the one in these shoes, definitely let us know what it is that you go through. Now, over to burial. And uh, from a scale of 1 to 10, what are your pain levels? Nine. Nine. Okay, that's yes. not as bad as Esther, but still, you're talking about the same condition. Let me hear from uh, Richard. Richard, when you met Beryl, did you understand the burden she lives with? No, by the time I actually met her, uh, she had not been diagnosed or she, we had not known that uh, she had endometriosis. Mm -hmm. So it's something that we've come to know about it when we are in marriage. Okay, so you get to know about it and then you're told that she has lost part of her reproductive organs and she might not conceive. What's going through your mind? Actually, I was actually the first person that the doctor informed about uh, losing the fallopian tube. When we met, she had already indicated that she lost the first fallopian tube. For the second fallopian tube, when she lost it, I was actually the first person that knew she had not even known. She was out of surgery, but the doctor had not indicated. Mm -hmm. So at this so point... A, so I would say it was a bit trick on me, because uh, you do not know how to break it to her that you've lost both your fallopian tube and uh, it's even difficult. I mm -hmm. remember I cried for a while, I was with my friends. And uh, mm -hmm. that day they took me, we, we, we went out, and I remember I broke down and uh, one of my friends was like, what is not happening? Because I was talking with uh, another guy that uh, is also a friend of mine, but we were not out with him. So they were like, what have you done to this guy? I, I told them, it's just something that happened at the hospital. I will explain later. All right. So you come to terms with it and still decide to stand by your woman. What led to that decision? Well, uh, I would say that, uh, one, it is not easy because uh, people consider that uh, in marriage you're supposed to have kids and you're supposed to have parents and then uh, you're supposed to continue your life mm -hmm. and all that. So for me, I look at it in terms of she's the person I chose. So we'll have to endure this together and we'll have to find solutions together. Okay, and uh, Beryl, your husband is going through his own experience as he understands better what you have to deal with. But you as a woman, you have this news that the possibility of ever conceiving is close to nil. What's going through your mind, my dear? I will be honest. I know people think that I joke that after I was told that I don't have fallopian tubes, me, I asked my husband to get another woman if he's in need of a kid, but he refused on that decision. Till today, we still debate on it. But I believe, I have hope that the day that I will go through IVF, it will be a one time of thing and I will conceive because I'm also yearning to be a mother, even if it's through adoption. But I hope that IVF will solve my solution one day, one time. All right, let's hear from Dr. Alex. Is it possible to actually conceive without fallopian tubes through IVF for such a case as burials? Uh, yeah, fortunately, we have uh, technology now that um, uh, you could bypass uh, the need for fallopian tubes to conceive. Um, it, it's not accessible to the majority of uh, individuals because of cost. And um, uh, we do know that uh, it, it does work, but it doesn't work for everyone, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. yeah, so there is an opportunity to consider that as an option uh, mm -hmm. to try getting pregnant. Okay, Esther, you actually got your second baby this year, is it? Third baby last year. Third baby. Oh, wow. So what is this miracle that keeps happening over and over again? 
God, <laughs> God is a miracle, but it keeps changing because this time I changed gynecologist and when I went in, I just told her, you know, this is my history. So just be prepared to find anything inside. So she came with another gynecologist just as backup, just in case she went in and it was, it was wild. But when she got in and she was looking at my tubes, she said, you know, I don't know how you got pregnant because the tube that's connecting the side with the least problems is actually damaged at the time. So it has changed. Of course, I'm also not the same age that I was when I was having my first baby. And the pregnancy was much more difficult this last time. So there's been a miracle, but doesn't mean that it's also been easy. Okay, and uh, let me cross over now to Richard. So here you are with your wife, and uh, Beryl has told you, Sasa, hapa, eh, getting another woman might be an option if you really want to have children. Why did you refuse? Well, one, I would say it is hectic to date more so in the current world. Two, it is a personal decision that I took because uh, one, uh, you've already offered yourself for marriage and you're married. So we did a church wedding and she's the person I chose. So in all that we do, I'm, uh, I'm, yeah, it's her that I choose. So I said, in everything that we go through, we'll go through it together. Okay, now that is a lot of faith and I think that is what Peter actually applied in his marriage and here they are three kids later. But I'm sure, Peter, there are people who were naysayers when you were starting off, right? Uh, yes, the naysayers are there. Um, and I guess the, 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 the thing is, like Richard is saying, you see, if you've already decided that uh, this is the person I'm committing to, then it changes a lot of, uh, for you in your mind, you have set yourself, uh, you know, uh, you've set yourself and you've said, I know this is what this person is uh, undergoing and I've chosen to walk the journey with the person. So I guess once you have made that decision in your head, this, uh, uh, despite what other people might be telling you or, or, or saying, you're, you know, you're already, you're already at the place, you know, okay, even if I don't get children, uh, I'm okay with it. Okay, now we'll take a short break on your world in a moment, but I'd like to hear from you even as you watch us this morning to help us understand your journey or that of somebody you know who lives with endometriosis and what the challenges are living with this condition. And I'll go back to Dr. Reed. Now, both couples, different journeys, same condition, but experienced differently. And you mentioned earlier, one in 10 women get affected by this condition during their reproductive years, but it takes over 10 years or close to 10 years to have a diagnosis. Why? Uh, the delay, unfortunately, is due to multiple factors. And, uh, you know, part of it is uh, the way we've been socialized. Uh, if you have pain right from when you're a small girl, uh, you, you speak to your peers or all the uh, ladies and they will tell you it's normal to experience pain. And uh, also when you go to the hospitals, uh, endometriosis does not have very classical symptoms. So you may start off with uh, maybe checking for a urine infection or maybe a genital tract infection, or it could have predominant bowel symptoms. So it can throw someone off balance. Uh, but more so it's because it requires something invasive to make that final diagnosis, mm -hmm. which is an operation called laparoscopy. And it's not always available. And even where it is available, um, not all cases of endometriosis look very typical. So you may find that uh, you can't see anything completely because everything is all matted together. Mm -hmm. Or they're very subtle uh, you know, lesions or disease spots that uh, don't quite look like endometriosis. So all these factors. Uh, and, and also, you, know, you might be put on the pill and uh, the pain disappears whilst you're taking it for ages. And when you come off the pill, uh, then maybe the symptoms return. Uh, there is nothing wrong with uh, treating presumptively, mm -hmm. uh, but you may not have final diagnosis uh, if it's not uh, made uh, surgically. Okay, again, different experiences we're hearing this morning, which now brings us to the question, 
which are these risk factors? You had alluded to some, but uh, it is said those that uh, perhaps choose never to have children are more at risk. Uh, starting your periods at an early age, going through menopause at an older age, are these factual and uh, which are the risk factors put you at crossroads with endometriosis? Um, kind of uh, associations that we have learned over the years uh, looking at girls who have endometriosis. So mm -hmm. if they have very short cycles and very heavy or longer bleeding uh, uh, duration uh, predisposes one to possibly develop endometriosis. So uh, it's kind of a chicken and egg scenario. We don't know whether it's one causing the other or they're just uh, coming together. Um, a family history is a strong risk factor. So if uh, someone has a positive family history uh, of endometriosis, they may uh, have endometriosis. There are other conditions uh, that we think may be linked or associated, but they are not necessarily causal. Uh, or they don't cause endometriosis. So uh, conditions that affect the immune system, for example, what we call autoimmune conditions, mm -hmm. may be associated. Um, some dietary associations have been linked, but uh, again, there's no farm science mm -hmm. that says if you eat this type of fat or this type of meat, you are predisposed. Uh, but there might be some link there. But importantly, what we need to understand is endometriosis may be present from a very early age. Uh, it, it's recognized later on in life, but it doesn't mean that it starts off later. Okay, now when we come back, we shall delve further into the stigma that these two couples have had to endure. I'm sure you've had some of the stories they've alluded to, but would like to hear more about that and how they've been able to actually handle the same. And remember that hashtag is new normal on our social media handles. If you'd like to share your experience or that of a friend that goes through this on a monthly basis, remember end of is not curable and of course you can also reach us using those numbers at the bottom of your screen. We'll be right back. with anatomic fit technology new morphix fans an invention from babies for babies you should also try morphix introducing pushindi cream bar soap pushindi cream bar soap with oxy bright removes stains effortlessly and brightens colors available in one kilogram and 800 gram bars and 175 gram tablets also available in all your favorite variants Pushindi, a quality product from Pani Oils. The crazy is we got arrested <laughs> while performing. Oh, yes. hey. While, yes. whilst performing. Hey. Hey. Elon Musk. See what Elon Musk has done with Tesla. You know? Like he's just managed to grow his company and grow his company and keep growing his company. So, yeah, just getting, insp just getting inspiration from people like that. Shout out to Lupita. She gave you guys a shout out. Yeah, she gave us a shout out this yeah. morning. So, that was really epic. Smartphone yang Google 4G screen kubo ya kuwatch game ni 3,999 peke ni ukweli pata smartphone yang Google kwa bei na fu kutoka kwa duka la Safaricom au dila leo Safaricom for you.
much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you for making us. Thank you for making us your favorite drive show crew. National FM, we love you. Oh, thank you, people. This is the I'm stitching. You and the one cheesy. I'm like a bamba and show you when they let evil, evil. Okay, to wrap it up, do my thing, my Thank you for listening to Knives is point three nation affairs. Of course, Antona Obina. Antona Obina. Call him taking control. Mad love, uh -huh. mad respect. Uh -huh. Why? I run the city. Was, uh... It's one platform where everybody has a voice. If we don't have jobs, it if we be, don't have money, if, we're not, if our business... <laughs> Hosted by the King of Wit. Do you know the Bible to that much detail? <laughs> it's basically everybody's show. Vitamin C ni kasava, shauri ya guvu. Vitamin D ni dania. I have decided. <laughs> the Wicked Edition with Dr. King Ori and the Guesswork CEO, Kenya Jui. The Kisumu County Assembly specializes in stimulants to be specific, concentrated coffee. Where humor meets sense. <laughs> the Wicked Edition. Every Friday at 7.30 p.m. Only on NTV. Try Panadol Advance for relief from headaches, body aches, and fever. With Panadol's Optizob formula, the tablet gently breaks down in the stomach, quickly absorbs, and starts providing pain relief in 15 minutes. For fast and effective pain relief that you can trust, try Panadol Advance. <laughs> Thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Gashanja. This morning, we are focusing on the Endometriosis Awareness Month and uh, understanding more about this condition. And helping us with this con with this conversation, rather, is Dr. Charles Muteshi, who is an obstetrician and gynecologist at the Aga Khan University Hospital. We're joined by two couples. One is Esther and Peter Kimemia, joining us from Mombasa. And we have Beryl Akinio Kej and her husband, Richard, who are joining us from from Kisumu. Now, before we go back to that conversation, a woman in Kisumu is one of several with a rare case of bleeding through the navel during menstruation. Now, research shows a rare type of endometriosis that affects 0.5 to 1% of women worldwide and may cause the bleeding. Here is Saum Hassan's story. When Saum Hassan woke up in the middle of the night with wetness around her stomach area, she thought it was sweat. She had just started her monthly period. But on touching her tummy, she discovered it was blood. And on further check, she discovered it was coming from her navel. Um, so I was shocked. So I didn't to even family members, I didn't to the 36-year-old mother of one started experiencing painful periods after her secondary education and whilst she thought the pain would reduce after giving birth, it became worse and a year ago she started bleeding from her navel every time she is on her menses. Akama pad, but sasa uwa na chukua koto nula, na eka hapo and then na shika na hiyo elastic. Hiyo nini, inaitua adhesive plaster hiyo. Nikisha eka koto nula na stick na hiyo. So every time, hata nikienda kwa washroom, lazima niangalie. Kama imeja, itabidi ni change. Kwa zuspo, iangalia, ina stay nguo. Malafu mara mingi ni, 
ni chungu wezi kai bi wezi inama kusimama pray tuwezi hata kulala inakuwa shida inabidi unalalia side moja she changes the cotton wool at least three times a day there are three small holes on her belly button from where the blood oozes she tells me she experienced lung failure and is now worried about her health mm, sasa daktari aliniambia iko tu sawa itaisha with the time ni kitu tu ya kawaida but sasa mimi naona kama si kawaida cause hiyo pain inazidi sana it's a different kind of pain si ile pain unaweza meza hata pain kila ishe Research shows that Saum is one of about 0.5 to 1% of women who experience bleeding from the navel during menstruation. It is a symptom of umbilical endometriosis. Her son is now 80 years old and she has been trying to get a second child in vain. Saum is afraid this condition may be the cause for her struggle in conceiving. So there are different forms of endometriosis and this one actually is one that involves the navel and Daktari you had mentioned it in passing give us more details about what Saum is living with uh, So this medically is called umbilical endometriosis mm -hmm. uh, umbilical basically will be the umbilic uh, umbilicus mm -hmm. and um, we, whereas we we may not know how it arises uh, there is a connection between the belly button or the umbilicus uh, right down towards the bladder and uh, uh, the reproductive organs. It, it does close after birth and uh, it, it, the, that connection is not um, uh, useful. However, certain cells which are similar to those that uh, line the womb uh, and uh, that will be what we call endometriosis may escape and find themselves uh, trapped and implanting in this area mm -hmm. um, because they behave exactly like what happens with uh, the lining of the womb or mm -hmm. endometriosis in the body every time you have a period uh, they would bleed because they're going through those uh, hormonal changes that uh, the womb lining undergoes mm -hmm. um, because of the continued bleeding and scarring and what we call inflammation they will cause pain and uh, if you touch, you, you feel some form of uh, hardness or what we call nodularity. Uh, it, it may respond to pain relief medications, uh, but most of the times uh, it doesn't. Uh, mm -hmm. It requires that uh, it's actually removed. Uh, and when it's removed surgically, most women will, uh, will feel better. Uh, again, it's important that if there is suspicion of uh, this form of endometriosis, mm -hmm a concurrent laparoscopy is done at the same time to make sure that there is no endometriosis in the pelvis because there would be no point uh, removing one disease and, and not making sure that uh, you haven't tackled uh, the rest. Um, and also, where it's located, the navel is very, very thin part of the abdominal wall. And uh, if it's removed in a big chunk, it could leave a defect, uh, which can also predispose to other problems such as hernia. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it's a situation where one has to be very careful uh, that they've got the right setup uh, and competency to uh, go ahead and operate. All right. So in the case of Salmu, she can actually get corrective surgery to help her along? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Uh, we, we see quite a few of this. And somebody is asking, asking, so you mean she bleeds normally like any other woman every month, but there is still this discharge that comes through the umbilical cord? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it's not connected to the, to the womb. So she's not bleeding from the womb through the navel. But it is instigated every month because of the periods. Yes, the hormonal changes that uh -huh. happen. Okay, interesting. Now, before I went to break, I mentioned that we needed to understand further the stigma around endometriosis because this is also another impediment to many women getting the timely diagnosis and interventions. Now, I'll start off with you, Beryl. What have you lost in your journey with endometriosis? Uh, in my journey with endometriosis, I've lost part of my family members and I've lost friends. And the reason is? Because I'm not a mother, 
uh, as my husband said earlier, most people know that once you are married, you are supposed to have kids. Mm -hmm. But people don't know that it's not marriage is not all about kids alone. So pe most of the people don't understand what I'm going through. So people think that I'm a curse because I can't have kids yet. I've been in marriage for the past six years. Okay. When you say you have <laughs> lost family members, are we talking about your side of the family or the in-laws? both of our family members even your own family yes my distant aunts but i have supportive i have a supportive mother mm -hmm. and her sisters and her brothers okay. there are those that come from my dad's family mm -hmm. because my dad is late others don't support me Okay. Now, let me bring in uh, Richard. So, your wife is living this reality. Your in-laws must be giving you pressure as to why do you insist on staying with a woman who cannot bear you children. Talk about your experiences. Well, I would, I would say that uh, they will not tell you directly, but it is implied. So you get to learn about it from the background but now <clears throat> in order to keep things going you decide let me do the things that i want to do on my own if there's anything that they would need then they would give me a call and uh we've had family meetings uh, she comes and tells me that something was discussed while i was not around so in order to protect her we've uh, not traveled home for quite a while Oh my, so this has put a strain to your relationship with your own family members. Yes. Okay, so apart from the fact that she cannot give you a child, has any of them taken the time to understand why? Uh, so far, so good. I would not say there is nobody that has inquired on what is really happening. But now, based on the several interviews that we've been having, People now get to understand, okay, this is what is happening. So somebody gets to ask after they've had, and after we've been online or have had an interview. Mm -hmm. Now, you said when you were given the first diagnosis and the reality of what you had to live with with your wife, you broke down amongst your boys. These boys, have yes. they stood with you or have they questioned your, your decisions? Actually, they've had us running. Uh, for quite some time. I lost my job in uh, 2019, mm -hmm. September. And they have supported us uh, till now. Oh, wow. Those are boys to stay and stick by, really. And uh, we celebrate them this morning. So when you imagine what you've gone through and uh, the pain, both physical and psychological, that this couple deals with, what would you like to encourage men who have literally walked out on their women who live with this condition? Well, what I would say is uh, you need to take a personal stand. It would vary from one person to another, but you need to take a personal stand. It's the person you chose, so you need to stick with them. So that is what I would pass to them, stick with the, the person you chose. All right, let's cross over to the man of faith, Peter Kimemia. Your wife has gone through a lot, continues to go through a lot because the symptoms morph with time. What are the circumstances that have been difficult for you as the primary caregiver to Esther? Um, I think for me, the uh, difficult circumstances, I'd say, obviously, uh, uh, right now, we thank God that she's much, much better and, and is able to do pretty much uh, anything she wants. But in the earlier times, <clears throat> you'll find that there are many things she'd want to do, but she's held back uh, because of the endometriosis. And I think for me, that was, uh, you know, this is... Uh, somebody who is youthful, who has uh, dreams, aspirations, mm. but uh, keeps feeling that there's something that is uh, holding her back. So for me, it was always just that thing of being able to encourage someone that, you know, you can still follow these things, you can still pursue the things that you you desire, you know. And uh, for us, at least, I, I, for us, I can say at least God has been faithful in that aspect that even as she's progressed, 
she's now pretty much able to do the things she would uh, want to do. Uh, I think the only one she hasn't done is uh, climbing at Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> it has been, <laughs> so this is only to do of this, of this, but yeah, pretty much everything else is just even being able not to progressively be able to do it. And also now also become a champion in terms of endometriosis and just bring awareness to, to, to it. Okay, now Esther, definitely this has even given you the strength to not only found the Yellow End of Flower Foundation, but give hope to many other women and couples on this journey. Yes, I keep saying, I think I started talking openly about endometriosis when I had my first one. And incidentally, we only have girls. So I keep looking at them and even just listening to Dakari sharing eight times more likely and I shudder and I'm like, there needs to be a cure that's found. But I started talking because I realized this is another generation and they need to know more. And there's a lot I wish I knew as a younger girl. I feel like if we teach girls at a younger age, they have a lot less to unlearn in their 20s or 30s as well. Mm -hmm. But definitely it has given me a sense of purpose as well. It changed. It changed what I was doing. And now I just want to talk about menstrual health every day. If it helps one woman, well, then good. If it helps a family, that's even better. But just making sure that no one has to wallow in pain and loneliness as much as I did during my journey. Okay. And what kind of a difference does it bring having Peter walk with you even as you do advocacy? A whole lot of a difference. You know, sometimes you, social media is, is an interesting place to be because you won't always get people responding, but that doesn't mean that they're not listening. So he constantly encourages me to keep sharing, to keep speaking, even though sometimes it seems like I'm sharing too much. But I think after surviving endometriosis and the way it ravages, you know, your whole life. I don't know what too much is anymore because if it's a whole body disease, many people think it only affects your pelvis or the organs that it hits, but it affects your mind. It affects different parts of your, of your being. So just to keep being bold in that sense and also just reminding me that it's for our children and it's for people like us where we were 10 years ago. And I remember, you know, he didn't really say, but when we were courting, I just told him, you know, Maybe you should find a woman who is more likely to give you to give you children or to facilitate the process of having children from her own womb because it was really a gamble. But he said, I'm sticking. So he has really been constant and unwavering in his support. And we celebrate you, Peter. Now, before I hear from Richard also, let me take this call. Uh, Susan from Bigori, what is your question or your comment? I'm asking, is it? Oh, say hi to everyone for me, please. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking, does wearing trousers uh, cause uh, endometriosis in any way? Because I have a friend who's going through the same thing, and she's struggling with uh, getting pregnant at the moment. Mm -hmm. And I was, she has been told several times, we went to the hospital, and she was told that wearing trousers has caused a lot of problems for her, and uh, her tubes, uh, like, they are blocked. Okay, so she was told by a doctor. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Susan from Miguri, for calling in. And uh, Dr. Muteshi, at this point, I think it illuminates the fact that there are some health practi practitioners who do not understand this condition. Uh, there's a lot of misconception around endometriosis. And I think part of that is because we don't know, <coughs> excuse me, what causes endometriosis. And, um, uh, you know, initially in the early days, it's one of those that has been misdiagnosed uh, as things like infection or other problems. Uh, there's absolutely no link between uh, your attire and uh, <laughs> endometriosis because we, we, we know it's moved through generations mm -hmm. and uh, we have evolved from how we dress, how uh, our lifestyles have been, uh, and endometriosis persists. So it, it's something that has been there. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we are trying very hard as medical practitioners and researchers to try and see if there are ways to understand it more. Uh, but more importantly, because we, 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 we believe we know a lot more now medically, it is how much uh, the community and the wider general public understand 
uh, about endometriosis. Uh -huh. yeah. All right, speaking of which, let me bring in Beryl and uh, Richard. Beryl, how much of a difference has it made walking and talking about endometriosis with your husband, Richard? Uh, one thing, I'm more vocal than my husband. <laughs> so me talking as I've gotten some people who always text me through privately, whatever they are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And I try to find solutions according to those doctors that have seen because already I've already approached three doctors. I've had four surgeries with three doctors. So um, this far with my husband, because every day we Google about something you know, that, is that is occurring in my body. Mm -hmm. um, my husband has been very supportive and I've grown to love him more and respect him as a man. There is no day that he has told me that I'm pretending that I'm in pain. Mm -hmm. uh, he's always stands by me because I'll be honest, since 2018, I'm one person that have not bended down nini, washing clothes. I hardly cook in my house. He always does all that. Uh, plus, when I get out of surgery, he's the one who does the washing of my body for, the, for at least three months till I'm stable to do some of my things. Uh, during my periods, because with this condition that we have, sometimes we clot, I mean, we clot, we clot past how we are supposed to clot. Is the one who's always telling me, don't worry, I'm going to wash those bed sheets for you. Mm. So he's been one person that understands me, also covers me during my work because me, I work with a football team. So most of the times he covers up for me to go to the field and engage my girls and my coach. Okay, and uh, you, as you said, are a very vocal uh, advocate of endometriosis and definitely an endo warrior. How much of a difference does it make having a man come on board and advocate right beside you? Um, it takes a lot. But I will be honest with you, Gladys, as much as I'm vocal, I've also, I'm also getting people who don't like the way I'm vocal. People think that I'm getting vocal so that I can get help. People think that I'm vocal because I'm just trying to teach people things that they don't, they don't understand. Mm -hmm. So having a man like Billy, I, uh, having a man like Richard, I hope that those couples or those, I'm not only talking about couple thing, I'm also talking about those people who are dating. Yes. I yes. hope those that have girlfriends or wives who have endometriosis, their men can be so understanding mm -hmm. and caring like mm -hmm. Richard. Okay. Now, Richard, okay. let me hear your experience here. How much of a difference does it make talking to men who are in the same shoes as you and them hearing that you stood by your wife and you continue standing by her? Well, I would like to say when it comes to matters fertility, fertility, men are laid back. So it really takes heart to stand by your person. And uh, I would try and encourage the men out there that uh, they need to come out more, they need to talk out more, also considering that it, not, it does not only affect the ladies, it also affects the men. Very well said. And at this point, I'd like to take some of your feedback. Remember, we are also getting to understand your experiences with endometriosis and anyone you know who has to live this reality. That hashtag is new normal and you can also reach us using those numbers at the bottom of your screen. Now, Dr. even as we understand what they have to live with on a daily and definitely a lot of stigma that they have to overcome on a daily basis, let's focus on the complications that come with this condition. It has been said, apart from um, the infertility you talked about, some patients have later been diagnosed with ademiosis. What is this and what does it entail? Uh, so 
the complications of endometriosis can be looked at from uh, different perspectives, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, just to kind of shed some light on uh, adenomyosis, it is the twin sister of endometriosis. It's exactly the same condition. However, uh, the cells that look similar to the womb lining will be found within the muscle of the womb. So this is within the muscle of the womb itself. And that's what is called adenomyosis. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if those cells are found outside the womb itself, then we call it endometriosis. So mm -hmm. it's exactly the same condition, mm -hmm. uh, but bearing different names because of the location uh, of these abnormal cells. Mm -hmm. Now, there are some women who've had to undergo a hysterectomy because they had adenoma adenomyosis. Why? So unlike endometriosis, which we can operate and uh, remove through what we call excision surgery, so you can go dig right into where it is, separate it from other organs. With adenomyosis, it's right within the muscle of the womb. And you won't find any demarcation points because it's kind of, uh, you know, uh, infiltrating through it uh, and if it's causing significant symptoms then um, it will be one of the consideration to uh, offer surgery to remove the womb uh, and, uh, and get rid of it mm -hmm. uh, because they more often coexist with endometriosis sometimes you may have adenomyosis and uh, have the womb removed uh, but the endometriosis is residual, remains behind, and symptoms could still persist. So it requires that you have somebody who can look at things very, very carefully uh, and with good experience to be able to tell what's the most appropriate treatment. Mm -hmm. And uh, speaking about treatment, Esther, you've talked about several surgeries that you've had to undergo. What is your treatment plan today? Uh, thankfully, as Peter mentioned, my story has really, really changed and I am currently not on any medication, yeah. but I have learned to listen to my body a lot more and I know its cues. I know when I am hormonally imbalanced, so I'm not doing anything in terms of medication, but just taking care of myself as a whole, including diet as well and avoiding the triggers, if I could put it that way. All right, but Peter, definitely the treatment plans before she got to this stage were costly. How are you managing this? Um, uh, I guess initially, uh, especially where she was uh, having surgeries, uh, I think we, uh, luckily we had uh, insurance, we were, we were both working. So a lot of the costs would be carried out, I mean, would be bared by the insurance company. Uh, but uh, like you're saying, I mean, the, there are things that to do with dietary. Um, I remember there's a drink, there's a, some, some green things you used to drink. I'm trying to remember what it was. <laughs> wheat grass, I yeah. remember, wheat grass. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I, I remember for the longest time I used, I used to be like, even if it is to encourage someone and try to drink that thing, and I'd be like, uh, it's, it's too much. In a but, uh, <laughs> in a uh, mm -hmm. so, but yeah, as, as, as we've gone, I remember that actually the attention was very sensitive to very many things. So, and just like uh, uh, I think uh, Richard and the wife have mentioned, even for us, I think the first few, uh, maybe, let me say, First two years of marriage, I can say the first year, but probably also this, a bit of the second year, I, I, I do a lot of the cooking and a lot of uh, just the doing stuff around the house. And I remember, especially with the cooking, I had to be very careful with what I cook, you know, spices and that kind of thing, just because you know that uh, the things that then are, mm -hmm. that you're using could affect or uh, uh, clear something up. Uh -huh. Okay, now when we come back from the break, I'd like to hear from Beryl and uh, Richard in as far as their treatment journey when it comes to endometriosis. But before I take that short break, remember hashtag in new normal is how you can reach us with your comments and of course any questions also to Daktari even as we understand uh, endometriosis and you can also reach us using those numbers at the bottom of your screen. Can we have some of that feedback before we take a break?
Okay, so as we know that this is a condition that actually affects very many women and as Dr. Tari mentioned, is the fact that most people live with this condition and have no idea they have it and have always thought they have a normal periods. Well, there's no pain that is normal when it comes to periods or period pain. So a lot of myths have been busted in this conversation. Now, Jenny says, every time I see Jambi Koikai, I thank God. That is one painful condition. Yes, Jambi is an endo warrior and we celebrate her for the work that she is doing in advocating for endometriosis. Jafet Nyamari says, true, several women living with it without a diagnosis. Thank you, Jafet. Yusufo Bote says endometriosis. Let's speak about support. Yes, and we'll talk more about that. And uh, we'll take more right after this break. Stay with us. Life, you must do little things every day, like the one, two, three with Colgate. One, wake up, wake up. Two, brush up, brush up. Three, smile through your day with a fresh breath and strong tea. Smile through your day with a fresh breath and strong tea. Do the one, two, three with Colgate and give yourself a future to smell about. Just one capful of Dettol is enough to disinfect surfaces and protect your family and your home. Dettol, tested effective against COVID-19. Making the bribes. Get 500 MP free killer siku and never miss a moment. After Kenyatta's death in August 1978, Muliro would raise his sights higher and announce his interest in succeeding Moy as Kanu vice president. He was determined to fight any system which was trading on people's rights. It was a sign of Muliro's strength in Luya land and especially among his Bukusu community that not only was he re-elected in his Kitale East constituency easily, but also managed to help his allies get elected. Muliro joined Ford Kenya when he failed to reunite the Odinga and Matiba factions. New Queen Imeshu Kabei smartphone and Google 4G screen Kubo Watch game with 3999 per care. New Queen Pata smartphone and Google Kabei na fu kutoka kwa duka la Safaricom au dila leo. Safaricom for you. Yeah, 
request pale kwenye hashtag jamdownke yeah man they call me dj mo the roughest and the toughest and i and i the caribbean queen miss katiwa call me the energy god mc jawochi don't you go nowhere cuz this is mtv jamdown Be wary. Not everything you come across on the internet about cancer is true. We look at the myths and misconceptions. And how much of a cancer risk is processed meat? We hear from health experts. Help build a strong foundation for your growing child with Nestle Nunkid. Nestle Nunkid 4. Our best for you. Try Panadol Advance for relief from headaches, body aches, and fever. With Panadol's Optizorb formula, the tablet gently breaks down in the stomach, quickly absorbs, and starts providing pain relief in 15 minutes. For fast and effective pain relief that you can trust, try Panadol Advance. <laughs> Thank you for staying with your world. My name is Gladys Gashanda, understanding endometriosis better on this Endometriosis Awareness Month. Still with Dr. Charles Muteshi, obstetrician and gynecologist at the Aga Khan University Hospital. And our couples, Esther and Peter Kimemia, joining us from Mombasa. And of course, Bur Burial and Richard joining us from Kisumu. Now, Burial, we were talking about the cost of treatment. You've undergone a lot of surgeries and uh, you perhaps are still on medication to manage some of your symptoms where are you at right now uh, right now I depend on injections mm -hmm. because as my husband said earlier he lost his work and last year a group of my friends took the initiative to pay for my NHIF so that I could undergo the fourth surgery mm -hmm. the third surgery I had a rambe from different football groups and I had opened an initiative in Facebook, mm -hmm. so it's been a hassle. For now, I have one month that I've not gotten injection because it's expensive mm -hmm. and I don't have that cash. So I just pray and tell God that kindly remove this pain for me. Mm -hmm. uh, before that, before he lost his work, we used to be in and out of hospital for long. I've tried all kinds of medication, starting from... Kienyeji Habon. Uh, it didn't work. Then we got back to the hospital medication. Mm -hmm. And when you say you rely on injections, these are to help you to ha with the pain? Yes, with the pain. Because at times I can't afford the tablets because they come costly. So I depend on uh, Zoladex injection or Visane. If I can't get those, I go for the cheaper injections. Mm -hmm. I get injected with diclofenac and there is a, there is a there is one that I've forgotten the name. Okay, and this is done once a month. <laughs> yes, but at times like. Between December to January, I used to have injections daily to maintain the pain. Because okay. between December and January, I couldn't go anywhere. I was stuck in the house because of pain. Okay, so Richard, listening to Beryl, watching her go through this, you lost your job, there's still an expense to cater for her needs. How have you been coping? Well, I would say it's difficult. We try and manage through the various friends that we have for now. And we pray and hope that uh, a job comes along or uh, the investments that we have start paying back. 
All right. Now, Dr. clearly there is a huge cost that comes with treating this chronic condition. Mm. You talked about surgery. Which other treatment plans are there for those with endometriosis? Yeah, it, it's quite sad that, um, uh, you know, endometriosis comes with a huge cost mm -hmm. and um, the cost is related to direct treatment costs. Indirect uh, 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 costs which are, you know, time off work and um, uh, people have lost their jobs actually. Uh, and and uh, even being at work but not being able to be productive is called presenteeism. So um, all these um, account for huge costs uh, in managing endometriosis. Uh, some of the medicines that we use, which are hormonal pills or hormonal injections for that matter, if they are taken for a long time, obviously they accrue a cost. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, um, uh, we, we are in an economic environment where insurance is not very uh, friendly uh, when it comes to uh, covering for things like hormonal treatments or conditions such as endometriosis, uh, because they may have a clause that says uh, this is an exclusion. Uh, so it, it calls upon a lot of advocacy to change this narrative uh, and uh, treat it like any other uh, medical condition that requires ongoing care. Mm -hmm. um, surgery uh, has huge costs and uh, either related to the primary surgery or the fact that the surgery was ineffective so you have to keep doing it and uh, uh, it's always imperative that if you are able to have a diagnosis uh, from the first laparoscopy, if the doctor is not able to remove the disease, then uh, give you a medical report and a proper referral uh, to someone or a center that can tackle the condition. Mm -hmm. uh, because it doesn't help it to have repeated operations that are not uh, removing uh, the disease, uh, but potentially have other risks that come with it. Okay, and uh, we have NHIF that most Kenyans rely on and of course those who can aff afford private insurance. Do these insurances stand with the women that need these treatment plans? Uh, so we have ongoing conversations to try and uh, educate and enlighten them so that they can, uh, you know, expand their cover and also understand uh, that uh, surgery for endometriosis uh, is not one, uh, uh, one type of oppression. Uh, for example, I do uh, uh, complex surgery for endometriosis, so when I fill in a pre-op, uh, and say uh, this is complex endometriosis and we may uh, operate and this would be the costs. Mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes the insurance will say, oh no, we've got somebody who is cheaper uh, because uh, they can do laparoscopy, but uh, they wouldn't understand mm -hmm. the extent of their oppression. So a lot of education and uh, you know, uh, awareness at that point is required. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I think more importantly is also the fact that uh, you know, that advocacy to just make sure that they continue support because mm -hmm. treatment doesn't stop with that final operation. All right, let's talk about follow-up care because somebody can come to you, get the surgery, and perhaps they are from a different county, but there's a follow-up care and, of course, treatment plan for these patients. Do we have the muscle in as far as personnel that understands how to treat endometriosis in the counties? Uh, so we, 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 we have in place, so it's, it's quite nothing, that uh, um, we've established linkages with referring doctors. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they suspect endometriosis and you, you, you make a plan and maybe you treat the patient, uh, you write down an ongoing plan for the uh, follow-up mm -hmm. uh, so they can be seen by their primary doctor. And if there is any query along the way, I'm, I'm phone call away usually. Mm -hmm. Okay, so even as we wind up this conversation, I'd like to hear from the couple starting with you, uh, Esther. They say that nutrition has a way of helping along with the endo symptoms. Has this worked for you? And uh, apart from the green thing that <laughs> Peter was talking about, what else have you seen that has helped in your nutrition plan? I think it definitely plays a role because most times you're dealing with endometriosis and other symptoms as well, mm -hmm. or other conditions that piggyback on endometriosis as well. So for me, I've found that definitely watching what I eat helps. One of my main symptoms that I still experience to date is fatigue. 
So if I'm eating a lot of wheat, of course, I'll be very, very sluggish mm. and I'll have, you know, my crash and burns during the day. But of course, avoiding food that is very inflammatory in nature. I've made other changes also in terms of skincare. Part of the reason I also keep my hair short, um, avoiding chemicals that I don't need to come into contact with mm -hmm. has also made a very big difference for me. Oh. But this eating colorful foods, avoiding the triggers, and triggers differ from person to person. Because of the location of endometriosis, I was very prone to having difficulty with bowel movements. So I avoid anything that moves me in that direction, that you know makes me prone to constipation. But yes, uh -huh. food, food has made a huge difference for me. Okay, how about you, Beryl? Any nutritional changes you've had to adopt to help you along? Yes, I had to change a lot of things in eating, but there, always the, the, there is always that craving that I miss some foods. Mm -hmm. I will be honest. <laughs> so anytime that I try eating these foods, like which ones? I always <laughs> chapati and cakey. I have a sweet tooth. Ah. I really miss cakes. <laughs> yes, so I had to change a lot of things. I don't do red meat. Uh, I do white meat. Anytime that I try red meat, it always goes highway with me. Uh, once in a while, I try to try. I try doing those nutrition things that I was told to try and eat some food. But at times it's hectic now that, as my husband has said, he lost his work. So me and nutrition now, we are opposite ways. So I eat what I can get. Oh. When I don't get anything to eat and I know it will bring me problems, I take tea. Okay, I hear you. Now, let me hear from Richard. Just listening to your experiences, endometriosis not only takes a toll on the physical, but it also takes a toll on the mental health. How do you ensure that you and Beryl always keep your head above water? Well, I would say I am one person that... Uh, is not troubled that easy. Mm. And at times she gets to ask, why are you not so worried? Then I tell her that uh, in every situation, there's always a solution and uh, we are always there to be tested. So I know that we run through the test and definitely test. Do you still talk to your boys when things are thick? Yes, we talk and talk a lot and they always inquire how we are doing, how is Barry doing. They will mm. always ask. Okay, and for you, Beryl, who keeps you accountable to not only keeping to the medication, but also ensuring that you are always mentally healthy? I have my mom, I have my siblings, and I have my team, my girls team, starting from my chairman, mm -hmm. and I have other friends, online friends, that are those that have met and those that have not met. Okay. So these are those people that make me sane at least. All right. And uh, let me pose the same question to Esther and Peter Kimemia. Peter, who stands with you? Uh, well, for me, um, I, I would say in terms of the, just the mental aspect, for me, I typically I do a lot of, I, I take it out in the exercise. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Uh, that's primarily my, 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 my outlet, I would say, um, and, and you know, just doing things that, uh, that I feel would be a filler for me. Mm -hmm. um, I think maybe just because of, a, I don't know whether I'd say pro proximity or just that because also uh, we, we, we moved to Mombasa, I might not have many people that I interact with that I'd say that then I'd be having those conversations with. Uh, but even just like, you know, talking with Esther about it, taking time out and just going out and, uh, you know, uh, even if it's by the, the Mombasa, we have the advantages of being able to even just go to the beach and mm. spend time out there. Yeah. It, it has a lot of just being able to like, relax you and take time more. Okay. And for you, Esther, how do you ensure you safeguard your mental wellness? Leaving the house, I think that's definitely a big thing. Going outside, just seeing different things, playing with my children. There's something about seeing life through the eyes of a child 
And I have this amazing community of other Endo Warriors who I've met in Kenya, who we constantly check up on each other. And it's okay to say today is a bad day and you know there's no judgment or I'm tired for the fifth time in the week and it's fine. So just being able to know where I can run to for, for help and also for no judging. And Peter is also really great. Sometimes I just tell him today's a bad day and it's okay and tomorrow we will try, try again. Okay, now Dektari, just uh, listening to the couples, I think it goes a long way to hear the men lend their voice to this conversation. Is this something that you're also intentional about even as you cater for your patients at your clinic? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, not all girls who come through have uh, um, uh, a male partner, but uh, um, uh, you might have a brother, a father, or uh, uh, an actual intimate partner. And um, whereas you may think endometriosis is just your problem, uh, it isn't. And uh, uh, even the men who are looking uh, uh, after you or live with you uh, get affected in one way or the other because it's very help helpless feeling. Uh, to see someone writhing in pain and you can't do anything. Uh, and that's not uh, a one-off thing. It's something that is either constant or recurrent and predictable. Uh, so eventually it may stretch you uh, and you may feel resilient, but uh, you know we do have limits. And sometimes when we go beyond these boundaries of limits, we may not recognize. So it's always good to have that reflection. And uh, it, it helps us very much in our clinic because we've got this uh, uh, holistic approach to care. Uh, where we, we will look at everybody who is around you, educate them as well as find out if they are struggling with you and offer that support. All right. And uh, what have you seen is normally the most, the biggest challenge, especially for couples, because these couples we have today represent <coughs> a unique uh, circumstance or circumstances. Most couples actually separate due to the impact of endometriosis. Yeah, so the biggest challenge is lack of information and uh, a lot of people will fall back to Google and uh, if you were to search endometriosis on Google right now, uh, the first thing you will find is that uh, endometriosis infertility and if you went to theatre and your wife was uh, undergoing surgery and doctor comes out and says, oh well, I, I found endometriosis before she even gets out of anesthesia, uh, men will think, oh, mm, it says endometriosis, you'll never have children. And that immediately has an impact. So it's that misinformation uh, and lack of uh, information that is the biggest problem. All right. So now I really need to close the show. But before I do, I've got to hear this from uh, our panelists this morning. We have wrongfully normalized pain during periods. And uh, periods, as we've said, had from the doctor and from your own experiences, should not be painful. For you who have firsthand experience, I'll start off with you, Beryl. What would you like to encourage others who walk in your shoes and those who do not understand this condition? The number one thing I'd like to tell people that period pain is not normal. Uh, another thing I'd like to tell them that with this condition we, we have with hormonal imbalance, we always get fat at times, we have big bellies, so people should turn down on asking us why we are fat and why we have big bellies. Another thing, people should stop asking couples when are they getting kids. Mm. That question is a killer. I'd like people to know more about period pains or anything dealing with hygiene and fertility. Because not as, as, my, as my friend Esther, she has endometriosis, but she has been blessed with kids. So people should know that not all endometriosis are the same. Very well said. And for you, Richard? <laughs> Well, uh, what I would say is uh, the men need to be more proactive. And uh, I think uh, men need to be more sensitized when it comes to fertility related issues that are more mm -hmm. leaning on, uh, on the females. Uh, this would uh, help us forge better relationships and indeed uh, keep us going. Very well said. Over to the Kimemias, Esther. The first thing I'd say is pain is not normal and it's not all in your head, which we've been told very many times. If you experience pain, please go and see your doctor and keep a, keep a period diary, keep a period and pain journal as well. So as you go in, 
you're able to present all of your symptoms, even though they seem disjointed, allowing your doctor to put the puzzle together. And then find a community. You're not alone. Find a community of other women who understand you. For those who are supporting us, please believe us. Sometimes we are tired. And the end of fatigue is very different from I have been working out all day. It's very, very different. So believe us, help in where you can and take care of your mental health. Because sometimes you lose the battle mentally even before you've lost it. Or you give up even as you're still alive. You know how we say you start dying slowly. So take care of your mental health and do, do what works for you. All right. And Peter? Uh, for me, I guess what I'm saying is uh, just maybe to echo what the doctor was saying that you now I think uh, information, just having the right information is very key, especially for the men. And uh, uh, also, uh, say what Richard said, and also just taking an initiative of saying uh, maybe even this thing a little bit, you know, take forefront and figure out uh, certain things that I can do that will make it easier for both of us, uh, in, the, the, in the case of those who are married or will be caught. And uh, yes, just uh, especially I feel just that the key thing of being informed mm. about uh, uh, about the process it's, it's very key for you to be informed. It even uh, lays a foundation of how even you interact with your partner once you know. Uh, the, uh, a key thing maybe is like uh, what Esther is just saying. Mm -hmm. If somebody is constantly fatigued, uh, you can't expect them to be doing certain things, you know. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, it would require that you know that, okay, as much as maybe we are both working, you know, uh, that this person might actually come home and be actually more fatigued than you. And now it's because it's our medical condition, you know. And, and just that kind of information makes it uh, life easier, just be able to plan around it. All right. And Daktari, definitely I think there needs to be a challenge going out to the health practitioners because a lot of delayed diagnosis is because they do not recognize this condition. Um, it, it, it is known when someone uh, mentions it, but uh, uh, it, it's not very uh, quick to kind of think about it if it presents in very atypical manner. <laughs> And, uh, uh, you know, speaking to your colleagues and uh, sharing your experience uh, uh, with this difficult condition uh, or a case that you've encountered will help. Um, it, it's natural to tell a patient in your office, uh, let me find out a little more about what might be a problem mm -hmm. and I'll get back to you rather than thinking uh, I must find an answer, give you a prescription right away and go away with medications because that pressure is what actually breeds. Uh, misdiagnosis. Mm -hmm. uh, and the other challenge to the public is uh, lack of awareness and uh, uh, a few people have been vocal enough and I think uh, uh, the approach would be that if you know anything about endometriosis, challenge two people and say to them, do you know what endometriosis is? And if they didn't know, explain to them and tell them, please tell two other people. So that will spread across and uh, in a short time people will understand what it is. Thank you, Dr. Charles Muteshi, who is an obstetrician and gynecologist at the Aga Khan University Hospital. The couples that joined us on this conversation, Esther Kimemia, who is an endo warrior and also the founder of Yellow Endo Flower Foundation in Mombasa. And she was joined by her husband, who is also her primary caregiver. That is Peter Kimemia. We celebrate you. And of course, Barry Lok Akinyi Okech, who is an endo warrior, very, very vocal advocate of endo and was joined by her husband, Richard Okech, who is also her primary caregiver. We celebrate you, Richard, and we pray that more men can lend their voices to endometriosis awareness. Well, that's it from us here on Your World, but tomorrow... My colleague Victor Kiprop will be delving into the digital economy which has been illuminated by the pandemic. How are digital content creators leveraging on this space and how can you be part of it? Well, more will be discussed tomorrow morning from 7 a.m. But before I say goodbye, I am told that my colleague Kevin Mutai, who is in Mombasa, has an update on the first plane from Romania, the first one to land from Romania with over a hundred tourists since COVID hit us. Kevin? Well, indeed, uh, Gladys, this is a major boost to the tourism industry. Negotiations have been going on 
uh, between uh, the Ministry of Tourism and other stakeholders. Remember, uh, this is happening at a time the country has been grappling with the uh, the punks of coronavirus pandemic and uh, the flight, the charter flight from Romania just touched down a couple of minutes ago and as you can see tourists are making uh, their way to uh, check out of uh, the Moi International Airport here in Mombasa and they will be going to different hotels in the coast region. Remember uh, the hotel industry was one of the sectors that was hardest hit uh, by the pandemic uh, since countries international countries, even here in the country Kenya, uh, where the government had to put in place uh, uh, stricter measures to uh, curb the spread of the coronavirus pandemic. I can see quite a majority of uh, tourists that, are just, that have just landed have their masks on. And of course, remember that uh, uh, according to stakeholders, this is just one way to make sure that uh, the industry will be able to recover. and. All these tourists, as I said, will be uh, going to different regions. I understand that we are expecting several other flights that will be coming in until uh, the month of August later this year. They are on a rotational basis and this is just one flight uh, from Romania. I understand there are also other negotiations with other countries such as uh, Russia, uh, Poland and we're also expecting to see uh, other charter flights uh, from uh, those areas. So I understand that officials from the Ministry of uh, Tourism here, the Kenya Tourism Board and other stakeholders uh, who are part of uh, uh, what's going on right now and indeed this is a, a, a sign of showing the recovery in the tourism industry. The industry has been depending largely on the local market and now coming uh, with this flight uh, touching down in Mombasa, it signifies uh, you know, an, an opening, a new uh, a new a new a new chapter in the sector because uh, i remember uh, for the last uh, eight months or even more uh, the local market has the one has been the one that is uh, has been supporting uh, the sector but of course also there are different interventions that have been put in place uh, by the sector players including the government to ensure uh, that the industry will be able to survive post covid the government even pumped over two billion shillings to ensure uh, that uh, the hotels will be able to, uh, you know, uh, uh, do refurbishments and uh, uh, before uh, the uh, able to receive the guests. Remember, also we have uh, 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 the, the parks and uh, game reserves here in the region, such as uh, the uh, Savo East, Savo West, and these are the places that these tourists will be traveling to. We also have the Maasai Mara. So they are here with uh, a lot of expectations. Uh, the government now expects also uh, that uh, uh, with this only one flight touching down today after all those months uh, with the, uh, when, when the country has been suffering from the uh, effects of COVID-19, then definitely uh, the tourism industry is uh, somehow heading to uh, what we call post-COVID now. Uh, remember, of course, also even in the hotels, they have restrictions in place to, of course, uh, again, uh, 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 curb the spread of the virus, such as uh, taking the uh, temperature measurements and, of course, also uh, ensuring that even before even the tourists travel, there are other restrictions in place, uh, even to ensure that they get tested before uh, they come uh, to the country. Of course, I'm sure those are the things that they'll be looking at. And, of course, as you can see, also, uh, the uh, are being welcomed with the traditional uh, dancers here in the region. Those are uh, Guriyama dancers. It's a welcoming and a warm uh, uh, reception that they are going through here, another witnessing here uh, at the Moi International Airport. So we'll be speaking uh, to officials from the Ministry of uh, Tourism and other stakeholders who uh, we will be talking to to really uh, try and understand what really this means. Remember, uh, we've been grappling with the effects of COVID-19. So uh, just stay tuned to NTV. We'll be having all this uh, packaged for you uh, in a very, very comprehensive way in our subsequent uh, bulletin. So uh, that's it for now from Mombasa and that's it for the NTV uh, World Show until tomorrow. Again, or rather later in our subsequent bulletins will be coming uh, to you with more details from Mombasa.
presenting the new Hapik Bathroom Cleaner. Compared to ordinary detergents, its thick formulation gives you superior cleaning and kills 99.9% .9 of germs and viruses all around the bathroom. Blue for the toilet and red for the bathroom. New Year comes with New Year deals. Renew your corporate subscription and get a bonus. Subscribe to Nation ePaper for three months and get one week absolutely free. Six months and get two weeks absolutely free. One year and get three weeks absolutely free. To sign up, visit ePaper.nationmedia.com or email subscription at ke.nationmedia.com. Offer valid till 28th February 2020. 21. Credo Mix is all about anything created artistically by us for us. Music reviews. Feel the fresh vibes full of surprises as we get interactive with your favorite artists and celebrities exclusively. We will bring you all the latest hits, trending topics, and the weekly top 10 every weekday from 5 to 6. And you're watching Crypto Mix on NTV. Keep it love. After a year full of uncertainty, Kenya's leaders of tomorrow will soon sit for their KCP and KCSE national exams. Join the Daily Nation team in wishing our candidates success in the Faoluna Daily Nation.